that's okay. <laughs> oh God! Except in legal proceedings, but yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, hi everybody. <laughs> this is uh, Leslie Rohde with my usual unkempt hair and not shaved. Um, and then there's uh, Michelle Chan Sang Sangthorn, and I, I'm I'm not even going to try to follow up what I just said. And then uh, Dan Thies, you can't see his picture, but he's still trying to get the whole screen share thing. Oh, oh, there he is in that lovely black and white. Um, and, all the uh, rain in Houston has sucked all the rainbows out of the sky. Uh, right. That right. might be it. Um, yeah, not his power line adapter. That's horrible. Anyway, good. So today we're actually talking. Now, some of you may have seen a registration page at Facebook. Okay, that was a yeah, that was a little technical glitch there. Uh, to Keith's point, yes, we are having the usual technical difficulties. Not yeah, not usual. These are less than usual, so that's good. Uh, but Dan has a prepared presentation there. The These are things that more. usually don't happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, we're only six or seven minutes late. That's so awesome. Dan Dan has a presentation dealing with AdWords, and AdWords apparently is, like, really the bomb because we have, wow, 223 registered. Ooh. And well, if almost no email, which is, that's, uh, AdWords probably sells, Dan. It sounds to me like we should do more of that. Just um, well, it certainly helps people sell stuff. True. So I would yeah. think that given the audience that we have, things that help people sell stuff would be of interest to those people because most of them are trying to sell something or something similar to selling something, like getting a lead. Yeah, right. Yeah, which, okay. Yeah, and that's too hard to parse, so we'll just move on. So you know what? I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, do the whole... Uh, magical present to everyone here, which is in my experience has to be done twice. No, nope, actually, it, it worked the first time this time. So, am I the presenter? Of, you are, in fact, Dan, the presenter. That's so, great because I have a presentation now. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do today um, is a little bit of an update on something that uh, that we did a number of years ago called the AdWords triangulation method. Um, this is actually sort of a compressed version of the full method that we use to manage AdWords account, but it's kind of the, at the core of what people tend to get wrong when they're managing AdWords. And so a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you here today will be things that, well, if you're managing AdWords accounts, you might be doing wrong, unless, of course, you've been doing it this way all along. And if you have been doing it all along, where we're going to start first is give you a little bit of an update. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with the AdWords triangulation method. A lot of people have been through uh, my AdWords training uh, at one time or another. Or, um, uh, you know, of course, you know, I don't know, something like a quarter of a million people saw that uh, that video back in 2008 when we started yeah. calling it the AdWords triangulation method instead of just how I run AdWords because, <laughs> according to a man I know, that's not a very sexy name. So, um, AdWords triangulation method, you can shorten that to ATM, and that sounds like money. And that's really what this is all about. So I have uh, a series of these. I think there are going to be four, um, maybe three if I can pull it off. But this is part one, and this is going to provide an update for folks that have uh, seen this stuff before in terms of what's possible now, how we've been able to expand and improve on uh, the ATM method. And that's one of those... Uh, self-referring acronyms or something like that. Anyway. Yeah, the method method. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the AdWords triangulation method, if you're familiar with AdWords at all, uh, this will serve as a little bit of an introduction. But the kind of results that you can get with this, and uh, often very quickly, are are pretty spectacular. We had a lead generator that we took on recently, um, and right now we're looking at 64% more leads and uh, an 18% reduction in the cost per lead. Now, they weren't unhappy about the cost per lead before, but they're happier about the added margins and, of course, about the added leads, and that's just a month and a half uh, or so into actually working on the problem for them. Um, We've got an online retailer uh, who literally got three and a half times the sales and uh, got their revenue over ad spend from 320%, which was about break even, to 600%, which is, well, significantly better than break even. And by the way, as a retailer, you really shouldn't mind acquiring customers at break even from AdWords because those are people that you can sell more stuff to down the road. But, of course, if you can acquire those customers and make money, um, especially making that kind of money, you'd probably like to do that as well. And one of the best ways that you can get 
<clears throat> those multiples uh, on your uh, on your ROI is by using shopping campaigns. One of the things we'll talk about here today is how to use those and how to extend the AdWords triangulation method from just search ads, which is where we started back when there weren't shopping ads uh, on Google, to how you can actually uh, actually use it there. Um, you know, uh, we had uh, a lead generator that we started working with back in December doubled their conversions in 90 days without actually adding anything uh, to their uh, to their spend. And really, for anyone, would you like to increase the ROI in the AdWords campaigns by 20 or 30 percent and get that done in about a month? If you can get this applied and get this to work in about a month, you should be able to see that kind of ROI improvement. One of the reasons why when we do AdWords uh, audits, we guarantee that you'll see at least a 20% improvement in ROI if you implement our recommendations is because there's that much money, there's that much fat sitting there in almost every single AdWords campaign that I look at. And so, what is the AdWords triangulation method about? And this will be a review for some of you, but for search advertising, the key point here is that we start with exact match. Um, some other things that we do is uh, we run campaigns for testing purposes. That is to say, we don't know if we're making money on this uh, yet, and so we have a campaign where we have a limited budget so that we can spend money to test and try to find new opportunities. But we also run production campaigns, which means that we've got AdWords campaigns that we are running profitably, and we're managing them to managing them to increase that profitability and to increase the volume that we get from them, but we we really don't have to apply uh, a, you know, a budget restriction to them as long as they continue to perform within the right parameters, right? If you're getting $6 for every dollar that you spend, you don't need to say, well, I can only afford to spend $2 a day on that. You know, you can, however many dollars I can, I can buy at a sixth of the cost, I'll continue to do that. The other thing here is to optimize by opportunity. That is to find the, the, the places where you have the best opportunity to turn a profit and focus on working on those too, even if you're working on those at the exclusion of other things that uh, simply don't represent a large enough opportunity. In a lot of cases with uh, AdWords campaigns, when we take them over, if we're trying to deal with a small budget, we'll turn a bunch of stuff off because it's not the best opportunity and try to drive volume uh, on the stuff that is the most profitable. I think that just makes sense, and um, I don't think anyone would argue with it, but you'd be surprised how often people aren't actually operating that way. They're trying to do as much as they can to find every every no stone unturned, but let's, you know, let's, when we turn over a stone and we find gold underneath it, let's mine that gold before we uh, uh, start throwing money at, at turning over new stones. Now, for shopping campaigns, this is going to be a little bit weird for people who aren't familiar with the way I approach shopping campaigns because the first thing we're going to do is start with keyword research. And the funny thing there is Google tells you, well, that you can't target keywords with your shopping campaigns, and that's sort of true, but I'll actually show you how to do that um, in today's presentation, or at least the beginnings of how to do that. Um, and so what we're going to do with shopping campaigns, we're actually going to group our products based on the keywords that we want them to show up for. So what search query do we want to show these products on? And then that's how we group our, our products in AdWords. Uh, I'm going to show you something today called the high-low method, which gives you an absurd amount of control over the keywords that you use and allows you to segment the most profitable keywords and make sure that you are always bidding to the, the, the into the shopping box on your most profitable keywords, and how to control which products show up for which keywords by using what we call ad group exclusion, and this is kind of what Google would tell you is the, the, the main way to do it, but uh, really it's not. We actually get a lot more mileage out of things like high-low than we get out of ad group exclusion because ad group exclusion is really something that's more effective for very, very high volume advertisers. But the key to the whole thing here is we're trying to find the most profitable search result pages, the places where people are, uh, are, are making the most money, optimize those, get to where we can own those, get to where we can have our ads at the top of the page or always have our ads in the shopping box, and then crank that volume up as high as we can. So doing ad testing to try and get more uh, people through and testing different product images and things like that in shopping campaigns to try and increase the volume. So let's start though um, by going back to the core of the AdWords triangulation method and how it works with search advertising. And so the starting point for this to be able to do it effectively is to understand what an ad group does. And what an ad group does is it's got keywords in it, it's got ads in it, and the keywords trigger 
uh, the opportunity for your ads to show. The bids and mostly the click-through rate on your ads determines whether you'll be on the first page of search results and if so, what position you'll be in. And by the way, the top positions tend to convert better, especially for retailers. But even for lead generators, you really don't want to move too far down the page before you start to lose uh, some of the lead value unless what you're doing is truly unique among the advertisers that are on the page. And of course, the ads that you show lead to landing pages. And of course, you'd like all those things to sing together off the same sheet of music. And so think about it this way. If you know what somebody searched for, if you know exactly what they typed into the search box, then you could optimize the message that you deliver, right? You could optimize the ad, you could optimize the landing page, and you know, even uh, based on day of the week, you could bid a little bit more on certain days when you know that more people who search for that buy, and bid a little bit less on other days when, well, people aren't necessarily buying, or you might find that your ads actually need to be different on different days of the week in order to keep your conversion high across all seven days of the week. But if you cannot win, if you cannot figure out a way to make a profit when you know exactly what they typed, then you can write an ad that's exactly about that and take them to a landing page that's exactly about what the ad said about what they typed into the search box you're not going to do better when you don't know what they typed in. And that is why we start with exact match, because with exact match, we know exactly what they did. Taking the same keyword and using a broad match version doesn't increase your odds of conversion. Uh, all it does is increase the number of people that are going to see your message that doesn't work. And so get it to work with exact match, figure out how to make a profit with that, and then we can start to mine some of the other opportunities. And by the way, broad match, particularly modified broad match, can nowadays be the most uh, profitable source of traffic in your AdWords campaign, whereas uh, once upon a time, when I first started talking about this stuff, you really needed to focus most of your energy on exact match first, phrase match second, and broad match last, if at all. Hey Dan, so, I mean, there's yeah. some actually there's a there's actually a overlaps with what you teach in UTE as well, Universal Traffic Engine, where go after the most narrowly focused market first, get that to work, and then expand in stages uh, out from there. Right? I mean, right. If you, exactly. if you and and with you know with with uh, UTE with Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, you know, well, I mean, we we really use AdWords as part of UTE too. But mm -hmm. when you're focused on the the people that are most likely to be your best customers and you, and you can be successful with them, that gives you the ability to expand out a little bit more. Uh, when you try and target a, a, a large number of people and um, even if it works, you don't know which segments of that audience actually worked. And so breaking it up, segmenting it, uh, and that kind of stuff with Facebook advertising in particular is vital uh, to, uh, to making that kind of advertising effective. So let's talk about why um, exact match uh, means something uh, and why the search terms matter so much. I mean, the value in search advertising, the reason why you were all excited about SEO once upon a time and the reason why I've been excited about AdWords since they launched the thing is that it allows us to put a message in front of people and catch them in the act of searching for something and enter the conversation that's already going on in their mind. So when they type in well, heck, what, what, what did you, what's the last thing that you searched for, Leslie? Dare I ask? Let's see. What was having something to do with WordPress? Um, oh, how to? Oh, how to? How to change? How to change the header height in a Genesis theme? Okay. And so, what if that was a problem that was really hard to solve, and um, you needed to, to to buy a tool or something for that, right? Which we did, by the way. Okay. So. Uh, an ad that offered you the exact solution, the Genesis header height omatic, wouldn't that have like drawn your click and given what I would assume is some urgency to the problem that you were trying to solve? Isn't it likely that I could have taken your money right then and there if I had just been there on that search query with a message that matched it and a landing page that, that actually offered a sufficient solution for you? Well, in fact, I mean, the reality of what happened was that there was an organic ad uh, two, three, you know, two, three places down that answers the question. It doesn't actually do exactly what my my query asked for, but it did. It did a whole bunch of things that I didn't actually query for. So I still bought the tool, right? But still, it's you know, it was it was close enough in terms of targeting. It was organic that did it instead of AdWords. But yeah, would they be in good shape to do AdWords? And, and well, and by the, the way, way, they might not have actually been able to run ads against that search query, and that's why, as we'll get to towards sure. the end here, I'll explain where AdWords fits in, where 
uh, and where SEO and content marketing fit in uh, because you really want to try to fill in and cover um, uh, you know every end of the funnel as it were but search queries are just loaded with meaning and intent if you think about it when you when you the longer the, the query um, the more specific the query the more you can know about who you're dealing with but um, in the case where we've got higher volume search terms where we're not sure that much we can certainly do an avatar exercise and know who we want to see on the other side and who we want to attract to our ad and who to get to click and so things like who are they how do they feel where are they are they at the office are they at home one of the big differences between running ads um, on a weekday in the afternoon and on uh, an evening or a weekend is that people are often in a different place and so um, different ads are going to get them to respond differently what are they thinking what's their reward what's in it for them what problem are they trying to solve what are they going to get out of it and one of the most important things is how soon do they need it you know the other day uh, actually it was a couple weeks ago I had um, a, a busted thermal sensor in my dryer now um, Leslie I'm sure you've fixed a busted thermal sensor in your dryer at least once in your life because you've had a dryer for more than 10 years I'm sure yes but, I used the telephone to do that uh, but the when I went um, to try to find it I found it in a shopping ad there were three shopping ads that had the exact part that I wanted guess which one I clicked mm -hmm. the one that when I moused over it it said next day shipping available yeah well what Amazon is even doing some stuff it's two hour delivery yeah not on this part pal but uh, no, I get that thing is wow, the think about that. that made the price irrelevant and the only thing that mattered was that mm -hmm. right these guys said they could actually solve my problem and get me the freaking thing tomorrow um, but you got to think about uh, different search queries are going to sort of be contain more or less intent to take action so you might have you know the longer tail stuff it tends to be more researching or and the shorter queries um, and the very very specific queries as I'll get to on the next slide here um, are are much closer to them actually trying to, to take action try to do something in a lot of cases you'll you'll be able to tell that they have already decided what they want and all you have to do is offer to give it to them under good terms and how much and, and what have they decided about that so sometimes they're halfway between a decision and you just need to be able to tip them over and sometimes your ad can help do that and sometimes of course you're gonna have to get them to the landing page and finish that job but the meaning in those scourge queries also means for you money how much can you make on uh, on an ad for a search query well which one's gonna convert at a higher rate which one's gonna lead to for retailers larger transactions um, for lead generators which one's going to give you a higher conversion rate typically is what's gonna make the biggest difference in your cost per lead and so I'm gonna give you some examples to look at here so a higher converting query might be oh an engraved whisk broom where you can put mom on it or something like that if you're one of those sexist bastards that gets your wife a whisk broom uh, or personalized turkey baster or the bastermatic turkey baster or just bastermatic turkey baster for sale buy a turkey baster online these are high converting queries now uh, you'll if you've been running ads for a while you'll know that some of these you can't actually target very well with search ads because in a lot of cases you simply can't get enough search volume to bid on them lower converting queries would be the more general ones so things like whisk broom turkey bracer baster or how do I put the grease on the top of the turkey which I think still broad matches to actual ads for a turkey baster nice job Google I'm not really sure that a person who's asking that question is actually interested in buying something online because the turkey has probably already been in the oven for a while and it's a little bit late to sell them a turkey baster but clearly in any case we'd like to have our ads show up more and put more of our resources into bidding on and getting traffic from the higher value search queries so here's how you do it in search marketing terms we want to start with the high volume high intent search terms you want to get your ad on the search result page find a winning combination of an ad and a landing page and an offer and all that stuff and then wash rinse and repeat get as many of them as you can for low volume high intent search terms you want to get your ads on there if you can but sometimes you can't and we'll show you some tricks that let you get your ads on more high volume or high value search results uh, 
but if you can't get your ads on there, you can at least think about SEO as an option. Uh, you can build you know, dedicated pages that answer those queries, but think about not how can I buy lots of links and spam my way onto it, but think about building really good answers and then building uh, a base of support uh, for your uh, for your sort your sort of your short tail and medium tail SEO by doing content marketing and building an audience in the lower volume low intent search terms if you can write answers for them and do good content marketing beyond that to build an audience that makes your site sort of one of the defaults in your marketplace when those low volume uh, research type search terms show up you'll start to get a lot more people into orbit around your business and by the way the more people that you can bring in that way, the more people that you can put into remarketing lists for search ads, which is one of the things we'll talk about in a later presentation, but remarketing lists for search ads allow you to add, run uh, search ads on keywords that you might not otherwise be able to afford to bid on, but you can afford to bid on them for people that already know you, that have been to your site, that have you know, visited you multiple times. Those people are much more likely to buy from you than others, and so you'd be willing to pay more to make sure that your ads get in front of them. Not something that produces high volume necessarily, especially in the beginning when you start doing it, but it's something that over time gives you um, an asset that you can use to increase the value of your AdWords campaigns. Now, the way that we do this, the way that we set this up, is by structuring our ad groups and for people that have seen the uh, any of the my AdWords training or the uh, original uh, ATM video uh, this will be very familiar to you but rather than just say a, take a, a search term like purple widgets and throw it in there as a broad match which by the way is the default of what Google will try to get you to do um, you can do it this way so you can have one ad group that has the exact match in it and I highly recommend uh, using uh, one uh, keyword per ad group if you can and a uh, few more close variations if uh, if if they're too low volume uh, to get them into their own ad group but let's just say we're selling purple widgets here and so we're gonna take an exact match for purple widgets and we might also put an exact match for widgets purple in there if uh, that's got enough volume uh, to bid on Usually there's only one word order for the exact match that's going to have enough volume for us, but if the other one uh, does, we'll find out when we try to add it to our ad group. And of course our ad is for purple widgets. The landing page is for purple widgets, and depending on what, what we believe about the search term, we might try ads that say buy purple widgets, and we might try ads that say purple widget reviews. Who knows? We don't know what stage they're in in the purple widget process because nobody actually sells purple widgets. In the second ad group, you would you create a phrase match so purple widgets in quotes or and widgets in purple in quotes and that allows you to get more traffic and expose yourself to anybody that didn't search for the exact match but guess what Google will actually bleed over some of the search queries from your exact match ad group to your phrase match ad group and you might find over time that the difference between those in terms of what ads work best and in terms of what landing pages work best is actually significant and so you'd rather have them separated out. When you start out they're probably going to have the same ads in the same landing pages. We're not trying to get too cute here to begin with but giving you the, the control and the ability to separate them allows you to over time actually learn whether this ad that worked better in the exact match ad group actually works better in the phrase match ad group because in many cases your new best ad for your exact match won't be a winner when you test it in your phrase match ad group. To do that we use what's called an embedded match. Uh, I don't know how good Google's documentation is on this right now but I can't imagine it's that much better than what it was about 10 years ago when I started talking about embedded matches which is it was one paragraph kind of an oh by the way aside on a page about match types but you can actually put a minus sign in front of that exact match for purple widgets in your phrase match ad group and that will prevent the exact match from triggering the ads that are in your phrase match ad group and so now all of the exact queries go to the exact ad group uh, many, many advantages to this, including uh, later on when you learn how to dive into your search terms report, uh, you'll realize that you really don't need to screw with the search terms report on your exact match group. And that helps you uh, simply do less work, and doing less work is good, uh, especially if you're getting a better result while you're doing less work. So 
And then nowadays, uh, we have modified broad match, which we've had for a few years, but back in 2008, when most people learned about uh, the AdWords triangulation method, it didn't exist. Broad match was just a horrible, horrible thing that mostly sucked money, and people really used mostly either to spend lots of a client's money so that they could get their percentage of spend um, from clients that didn't know any better, or to do keyword discovery because, well, um, okay. I mean, I can think of a number of keyword tools that I'd used before I resorted to throwing money into advertising, but uh, there certainly is a place with broad match to do keyword discovery at a certain point, but you're talking about what would be at that point a very high volume campaign that has lots of exact matches that are profitable, lots of phrase matches that are profitable. But now we can actually add a third ad group to do keyword discovery and even do it profitably. Uh, by using modified broad match and to do that we put a plus sign in front of the words and so we say plus purple plus widgets now with broad match google might decide that pink is close enough to purple and that well um hammers is close enough to widgets to start showing your ads and wasting your money uh, but with modified broad match you either you have to have both the word purple or a very close variant like purples, I think, more purpley, um, and widgets, which might also be widget. Widgets and widget are basically the same thing as far as AdWords is concerned. And then for that, you'd add a negative match for the phrase. Now, do you need to add a negative match for the exact match? No, because uh, if you knock out the phrase, the exact match is also knocked out as well. So you really only need to add one, uh, one uh, <clears throat> negative match to your modified broad ad group. And that will actually allow you to get a lot more volume. Uh, you have to be very careful about how you should bid. Now, I did say that there was actually a way to make this work better, but I'm going to make you wait just a minute because I need to tell you about the evils of broad match. Leslie, did you know that if you do a broad match for dog beds, it will show up when I search for cat beds? <laughs> Uh, well, yes, because I mean the beds is taken separately, and so it says it probably would you know, human dog bed cat work. bed. I mean, it might as well be a fish bed. What the heck? Yeah, fish um, bed. Those are common. With broad match, Google is hyper aggressive. Um, they call it enhanced broad match now because they're really trying to super like extra match your just they whatever ad they can they think they can get the most money out of. They'd like to steal that money as fast as they can. And to be clear, that it does enhance their revenue. So they didn't lie about the name. We just didn't. Well, and it, it it does enhance the number of impressions and clicks that you can get. And so, um, and in a lot of cases, you'll be getting those clicks at a lower cost than you would have paid for otherwise. And so, everybody knows that um, clicks can be taken directly to the bank, right? No, wait, mm -hmm. they can't. So if you wanted to go crazy and add a broad match ad group and have a fourth ad group in your AdWords triangulation because you're you know, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a month and producing millions of dollars in revenue, um, or because you're in such a tiny, tiny niche that you um, there really is some value in going after broad match for keyword discovery purposes. So then we put in purple widgets all by itself with no punctuation of any kind around it. That should frighten you. But yeah, so wouldn't that make it the the AdWords square method? That would be I don't know because um, I'm, I'm confused just, I'm about that. But if you're going to do it, go ahead and add a negative match for the modified broad match, uh, which we've tested it. It actually freaking works, which is beautiful. But start to think you've already gotten all of the broad match variations that include the words you cared about. So how much traffic will this group get? I don't know. Uh, how well would that traffic convert? Well, probably not as well as the stuff where you knew what they searched for because at this point with broad match, you basically all you know about it is that they didn't type purple and they didn't type widgets. <laughs> and you sell purple widgets. Okay. So that, I uh, meant but basically, look, modified broad match basically kills the old broad match for anybody that's uh, that's not trying to just throw out a giant drift net and um, potentially burn money uh, to to find uh, to find new keywords that you didn't know about. Now, uh, by the way, sometimes you will find exceptionally valuable keywords in here, but this would be the kind of thing that you put into a test campaign with uh, you know a ten dollar a day budget or a five dollar a day budget, something that's not intended to spend a bunch of money. That's just something that you maintain as a way to find keywords that are actually converting or keywords that are actually getting clicks. But um, there's a whole um, art and science to actually setting up the ad groups for broad match because you have to think about doing dynamic keyword insertion. You have to think about dynamic landing pages. It gets ugly. Don't screw with broad match. 
um, use modified broadmatch, it's much better. Okay, and I'll show you how to now make modified broadmatch even more better and actually make modified broadmatch enhanced modified broadmatch. I know Leslie's excited. Probably Michelle is excited, but, uh, but she's not going to tell me that until after. This is really about trying to, um, and I, I say wallet out, and obviously that's a little bit skewed toward the retail side, but wallet out really means somebody who's ready to take action. When I sat down at the computer to figure out how to get my hands on a freaking XPJ22 stroke B thermal sensor for my dryer, I had my wallet out because I knew if I could buy one online and get one delivered the next day, I was going to do that because I wasn't looking forward to spending time behind the windshield driving somewhere to some uh, appliance part place where the appliance repair people go to get stuff, right? I wanted to get it. The wallet was out. And the same thing for lead generators. When you got somebody that is really ready, like, I need to do this now, right? I need to get a quote on insurance. I need to whatever. Um, when they're ready to take action, you want your ad to be number one because in a lot of cases, people are only going to take action once. Some people will fill out multiple lead forms to get mortgage quotes or whatever, but, well, um, those people, um, well, you better hope you're the first one to call them back because they'll be getting, they'll basically be cutting off that phone number uh, within a, a week or two with the number of calls that they're going to get if they've filled out multiple forms. But, you know, think about it. I needed one thermal sensor, right? I didn't need a thermal sensor from everybody so the first one I clicked was the first one that got a shot to sell it to me and all they had to do was sell it to me and I was never gonna click another ad again so when the wallet is out when the person's ready to take action you want to be in the number one ad at the top of the page well guess what um, that works great when you've got ads that you've been testing against exact match queries that can actually hold up to the uh, the demands of being competitive on a click-through rate to be at the top of the page. And you, of course, you also have to be able to actually bid enough to get to the top of the page. Well, of course, you'd like to, you know, speaking of intent, right, if somebody types buy purple widgets online, what does that mean? They want to buy a purple widget online. You'd love to be able to advertise on that. But guess what? As an exact match, Google's going to tell you, most of the time, in fact, almost all the time, your ads aren't showing due to low search volume. Well, that's kind of sucks, but then wait. What did Modified Broadmatch just let us do? They let us take words like buy, order, shop, free shipping, and stick them in there and actually make sure that they're actually those words and not something that Google Broadmatched to those words, which might include, by the way, with Broadmatch, they might just say, well, you know what? I wanted to, I put in a broad match for buy purple widgets online, your ad can show up when somebody types purple widgets. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? Um, but with modified broad match, you can make sure that those things actually show up. So in your modified broad group, you can add keywords like purple widgets buy, purple widgets order, uh, things like that. And guess what you can do? You can bid more. Why? You can bid more because you know they have magic money words in the search query. This will also apply to things like uh, Adidas or brand terms uh, or in, in some cases product terms. So like, uh, you know, I don't want to run an ad for uh, basketball shoes unless it's high top basketball shoes. Or maybe I sell both kinds or maybe there's more than two kinds. I don't know. Uh, I'll only ever wear high tops. but. Um, but when they type in high top, what does that mean? They know what they want, right? There's more intent there, and that means that you can afford to pay more as long as you're sending them to someplace sensible that actually matches what they're looking for. Uh, things like part numbers, model numbers, uh, you know, um, the, you know, Nikon XPJ42 lens. I don't think that's a real thing, but when they type that in, <laughs> they either want the repair manual or they want to buy it. And if your ad says, come here to buy one, you're probably not going to click it to get a repair manual. Those kinds of terms are gold, and modified broad match makes this very, very easy and a lot more effective to do because it really wasn't something that you could get away with with plain old broad match, but now you can. And so add the kind of trigger keywords like this, and they're going to be different depending on your market and um, and be different uh, depending on what you're doing. But think about you know if you offer an instant mortgage quote, wouldn't it be nice if the search included instant? Well, instant mortgage quote might actually be um, high enough volume um, 
uh, to advertise on, but if it's not, you can still get the ads in there and get them to show up and bid more for it when people type instant with mortgage quote because you can use modified broad match to do that and you can increase your bids when those trigger words are present and move your ads up to the top, top of the page when the wallet is out and maybe be a little bit less aggressive when the wallet isn't uh, quite as close to being sitting on the desk there where you want it to be really like them to have the credit card out and already have uh, you know something like uh, uh, well, one password or whatever uh, something to store their credit card information so they can instantly buy from you but you can't control for that stuff but you can certainly control for there being uh, action triggers in the keyword and bid appropriately and by the way doing that will increase your ROI so that took us through um, the search advertising portion of this but you can also apply this stuff to shopping ads. Wouldn't it be nice if you could bid a little extra for your shopping ads when people had words like buy now or order online? Sure. I think so. <laughs> but as I said, shopping doesn't allow you to do keyword targeting. Shopping only allows you to use negative matches, and you can use negative matches at the ad group level or at the campaign level. The way that shopping campaigns work are that, that all of the products that are in your feed that you've got um, bids on in an ad group um, are going to be matched up to queries. So when somebody searches for um, you know five-ton purple widget, well, what is going to happen? Well, Google's going to search everybody's shopping feeds for purple widgets, and then they'll uh, try to find some that actually say five-ton. And uh, some of the ads will probably actually be five-ton purple widgets, and some of them will just be regular purple widgets that Google threw in there because uh, shopping feeds are <laughs> the ultimate broad match uh, opportunity for Google. Google. They can stick anything they want to in there, and you can't uh, stop them unless you add negative matches to stop them from showing your ads for stuff. Now, everybody that's paid any attention to how to run shopping campaigns knows that you should use negative matches for keywords that mean this is not right for me. Um, and so if you don't sell you know, steel widgets, then you could put steel in as a negative match, but that's such a negative thing to focus just on the negative stuff that you don't want to show up for. What about trying to show up for the stuff that you do want to show up for? Now, most advertisers are kind of um, well, in a position where they're a little bit um, there's work to do uh, to get uh, to get to where they can do the stuff I'm about to talk about because most advertisers have one ad group um, and uh, yeah, all everything is in there in this one all products ad group in this one uh, shopping campaign and uh, surprisingly enough a lot of people actually make money doing that like, I think more people that I've seen are making money doing that by probably two to one compared to the people that weren't making money by doing it even the people that weren't making money weren't exactly bleeding money they just weren't really turning a profit on it but, of course, you'd like to start by bidding more for those wallet out terms, right? We just talked about that. We're going to do that with our search ads. We may as well do that with our shopping ads. But I know I just said you can't target keywords, so let's tell you how to cheat, shall we? The first one you want to use, there's two techniques here, and this is the one that you're going to want to um, uh, spend more of your time on early on because this is the one that will yield more early on, is what we call the high-low method. And so one of the features of the shopping campaign is that there's actually um, a setting in your, in your shopping campaign called priority. There's high, there's medium, and there's low. So you have three choices of priority. Now, if, um, if a product a a a has matched a, a, a keyword um, in the high priority campaign, then nothing in your medium priority campaign is going to show up uh, because the high priority campaign gets the first crack at it. But if you add a negative match for those money words like buy, shop, order, etc., and any search terms that you know you know from history from looking at your actual search queries report and that that have made you money at a really good multiple, you can add negative matches for those. Even you you can even use exact matches or uh, modified broad or any of the other things that you can that you can negative match on. You can add those to the campaign, and over time you want to just watch your search terms report. Anytime a search term shows up in your high priority campaign that's making you good money, you'd want to add a negative match to it so that it doesn't show up in your high priority campaign. We had a um, still haven't really gotten the client to understand this I don't think but I've had a couple of conversations with with uh, with one client about why their high priority campaign doesn't get very many clicks and their low priority campaign gets the most gets the most clicks it's because it's designed to do it that way the medium priority campaign <clears throat> will be triggered when the high priority 
campaign doesn't trigger. So if I put a negative match for buy shop, right? Someone so types in buy purple widgets, the high priority campaign can't trigger because I've got a negative match for buy in the search query, and so the medium campaign does because it doesn't have the negative match. And the medium priority campaign has higher bids. Um, there are lots of easy ways to do that. The easiest thing to do is just add a geographic target for um, the, the country that you're selling in. By the way, in shopping campaigns, you can only sell in the one country uh, in the campaign. And um, and just, uh, just do a geographic bid adjustment to raise the bids. What happened? We just bid more for buy purple widgets than we bid for purple widgets in our shopping campaigns. Woohoo! There's you some excitement. I knew someone would get excited at some point about this. And so the way that this sets up is your high priority campaign has the lowest bids. You exclude any high value queries, any higher value queries, and your high priority campaign is essentially the test campaign. It's a, intended over time to be the lowest volume with the lowest bids. And it's really, that's your keyword discovery campaign. <laughs> your, uh, your medium priority campaign would have the next higher bid level. And, and of course, if there are any queries that are like super high value that are just like golden money terms. And so uh, you might, uh, for example, for a retailer, you might um, exclude brand names at the high priority uh, campaign level. And uh, and you're going to have to exclude your part numbers at that level. But then you you at, at the medium priority level, you'd exclude your part numbers, and then the low priority campaign would have the highest bids and would catch people that are searching for part numbers. Where you can say, Hey Dan, you need that thermal sensor? We can ship that sucker to you over. campaigns and all kinds of different ways that you can do it and group it. But let's start by getting you out of that one ad group and that one high priority campaign and unpack that into multiple campaigns. Most of the time we're just operating two campaigns because most of the time it's it's really very simple. But um, you know, depending on what you sell, um, you'll find when you start to actually sell stuff through shopping campaigns in your search query report, uh, you'll start to see things like maybe personalized um, or monogrammed or whatever is a search term that, that converts at a lot higher rate. Well, you can just add that word as a negative um, in the higher priority campaign and uh, automatically bid more and make sure that you get all of the impressions that are available when people search for monogrammed purple widgets. But when people just search for purple widgets, well, your bid might not be high enough to get you that great of an impression share. But do you really mind? No, because the ones that you're after, the ones that are going to buy right now are the ones that already have their wallet out. And so let's focus as much of our resources as we can on to getting those people who have already told us that their wallet is out. And so this is one of the amazing things about shopping campaigns that actually lets us target keywords that we couldn't uh, easily target um, with, uh, with search ads because um, the volume is simply too low on them. But uh, thanks to the magic of broad match and negative match being combined together, you can actually do a lot of that. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you about one more way to, to control keywords with shopping campaigns, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because I think it's fairly self-evident. But when I talked about organizing your product groups in your shopping campaigns based on search terms, well, you really want to do that. And so we'd think about... Um, uh, targeting keywords, figure out what keywords we're going to target, and then think about one keyword-ish per ad group. And usually for a keyword, we well, we, there's only four products that you can get into the shopping box as a single advertiser most of the time. So you'd want to have you know somewhere around four products. If it's less, that's okay. If you have less, and if it's more, well, that's fine. You can get them in there and let them shoot it out, and you can bid those products individually based on um, what your profitability is when people sell them, and then you'll find out which ones people actually click on more, and that'll let you figure out which ones you're going to make more money on over time. But um, then you can exclude that keyword that you're trying to get these particular products to show up for from other ad groups that might trigger it. Well, what does that do for you? Well, it means that the only chance you have to show up for that keyword is these products, and it also means that you can bid them accordingly. Now, if they're not showing up and you think your bid is enough, it probably means that you need to go back and do some work on your product names, your product descriptions, stuff like that, because Google does rely on those heavily as part of the quality scoring algorithm for product ads, um, and you'd rather you know, show up as an affirmatively high quality product that Google is confident belongs on that page because, well, you're going to pay a lot less for those clicks 
Um, but uh, you know, doing this kind of control once you know what what keywords you want to target with which products allows you to bid appropriately for the keyword and actually play to win because you are dealing with people that are, are you know clicking on ads for products and are much more likely to buy, uh, or at least a little bit more likely to buy than people that, that click the search ad. Oh, by the way, um, if you do run search ads on the same keywords where you have shopping ads, you'll see um, that both of them tend to perform better, and um, you, you can actually measure this um, in AdWords by using the um, impression-assisted and click-assisted conversions metrics. Don't count on those as money, but recognize that when you see a large number of impression-assisted conversions, that isn't somebody that saw your ad and later got to your site, that's somebody that saw your shopping ad and then clicked on your search ad and bought and you're gonna see those people that actually are converting at a higher rate when they've taken a look at a picture and then they click an ad and so running both <clears throat> together is actually a very effective strategy but you still have to work on each of them individually to try and make them effective uh, and so really to use the ad group exclusion method one as a starting point Start by thinking of search terms for products. So group the products by search term. You can have multiple products that match each search term, and over time, some are going to be winners and some are going to be losers. And a product is bad for a given query. So if you've got a product that, oh my gosh, that that one every time it shows up, it draws clicks, but nobody ever buys, then exclude it from the ad group that you've set up to trigger the query. And if you want to, you can put it in another ad group with a negative match, but make sure that, that you just control that by negative matches. This is hard to do. This is something that we only do under high volume conditions because it is so much work to do and you really only want to focus on doing it for the highest volume keywords where the wrong product showing up can cost you lots of money and the right product showing up can make you lots of money and you'll know what those high volume terms are because they're the same ones that are the high volume terms for your search campaigns. Uh, that you're either running or wishing you could run if you could get your conversion rate up high enough. So don't overthink it um, with in terms of the ad group exclusion method because this might not apply to you, but the high-low method almost certainly does apply to you um, as a retailer. So that's um, what I've got for you today. And um, so uh, we'll take questions. And I know one question that some folks are going to ask is, can someone just do that for me? And the answer to that is yes, uh, we do manage um, our, uh, shopping campaigns, the Marketers Brain Trust. Um, if you want us to just set it up for you so that then you can uh, do the maintenance and management and all that kind of stuff, that starts at $1,500, but that's something we're going to have to quote every time. If you want us to set it up and running it, run it for you, that starts at $497 a month. Um, that's a management fee of a minimum of $497 a month, but 10% of ad spend. And for a lot of retailers, um, you really will struggle, especially early on, to spend more than $5,000 a month on, on shopping ads, even you know if you're producing twenty-five dollars or $30,000 in sales from them. Um, and uh, we do require a minimum of a three-month commitment on that because it takes time to for these ads to catch. When we make a change, and some of these changes are things that we have to do, uh, it can take, Michelle, uh, you know, three, five days a week for the change that we've made to actually become effective and that the new uh, the new place that we're trying to get our ads to show up actually kicks in and, 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 and works. Um, and after that, it's just uh, it's the, the same as uh, as uh, as uh, as we've always done. Thirty days notice to 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 cancel our service and take it back over. Uh, and if you sign up this week, there are no setup costs. Uh, and uh, we are going to go back to charging setup costs for this stuff uh, uh, in addition to the management fees at some point. But, um, well, we've got some extra capacity right now and uh, people to do the work. And so we'd like to keep those people busy and paid and stuff. So if you're interested in just signing up, you can go to seobt.co slash ppc1. Or if you've got questions about it, you're not sure if it's quite going to fit for you or you, you you know, you've never done it before and you just don't know, um, you can send me an email, danplusppc at marketersbraintrust.com. I'm going to ask you to give me access to your analytics so that I can give you good advice and not just say, yeah, sure, we can do anything you want, because uh, we're really not in the business of trying to find clients that we can't help. Um, and so that's all I've got. Do we have questions out there? I'm going to turn this slideshow off and turn my camera back on so everybody can, uh, can see my beautiful hair. Yeah, oh yeah, that's important. Um, let's see, it's time for some. I have unfortunately, I have unfortunately lost the chat box through not one but two uh, Comcast internet outages. Thank you very much, Comcast. By the way, if you're I'm surprised, I didn't get one. But there you go. Yeah. So 
And it's the first time actually one of these hangouts that I've had Comcast go completely offline. And it happened not once but twice in a 20 minute period. So, okay, um, so I'll, I'll read some questions. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, so Neil says stop throwing silverware. I'm not sure what that means. Um, one of us had background noise. Michael you know. said, what about modified broad? But I'm pretty sure I got there by the time um, I've seen yeah. this question. It's been answered. Let the dishwasher have the day off, says Neil. He's really focused on dishes uh, <laughs> there in, in Arizona. That's in Arizona. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Um, and mm -hmm. so Dale actually has a, a question. Noob question, he says. Is the syntax of your keywords as shown with plus, et cetera, entered? Uh, yes, that's a, that's yeah, that's exactly how you enter it into uh, into Google. And actually, there's a drop down menu now for exact match and phrase match. But if you want to do modified broad match, you have to put the plus sign in front of each word. Now you can actually do um, you don't have to put the plus sign in front of every word with modified broad match. So you can have a word that you're willing to let them go ahead and turn a dog into a cat if if you want to. But you have to make sure you want to make sure that they say bed. Then you'd say dog and then plus bed. There's no space between the the plus and the word. Uh, and that's how it works. And um, uh, Dale, if you got, you know, if if uh, if you got one you'd like me to look at, you know, just hit me with an email, and I'll take a look at what you're what you're doing before you before you do it. Um, we don't mind doing that kind of stuff. Um, how do you know exactly what a person searched for before clicking on your ad? Well, um, you targeted the keywords, and that's how you know. Um, well, I, mean, I think that may, I may shopping. That may have been in shopping, Dan. Is I think when that question was asked, but I did see that. You do not in shopping. That's the beauty of shopping, and that's why uh, we want to do the you know spend some time ahead of time mm -hmm. and not just throw all of our, our products into one big shopping ad group and let Google throw them at basically what when you do that what you're what you're doing is you're buying Google's spare inventory that advertisers who knew what they're doing didn't buy, and so um, you just you know, you're not going to see that spare inventory perform as well as uh, as uh, as properly targeting. Can I do a broad and modified broad in a, in a, in a keyword? Yes, K, you can do that. And it uh, looks like Dale's uh, got the answer he needed. And so, well, we don't have any questions there. I hope I didn't break everybody. No, I mean, I, I, I learned some great, yeah. I learned great things. And, and I had my sushi, too, which I was a little bit late on lunch. And so that was good. Um, when you have sushi and them, something else. That's some raw cool. fish and some raw data. Absolutely. Wow. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, good connection there, Michelle. That was awesome. Um, but yeah, it's the uh, let's see in KF. So modified broad will keyword for sale show up if you have plus keyword plus sale is used. Yes, that's exactly why you do it. Yeah. Okay. Why single keyword exact match group? That's it from from Neil. Okay, so Neil has a serious not question. About dishwashers. Okay, okay so <laughs> let's say that you were in the dishwasher repair business, Neil, and you wanted to run an ad when people search for dishwasher repair. If you can make money when people search for dishwasher repair, you want to geographically target that ad, wouldn't you like to be able to write an ad where and, and have a landing page where you know that that's exactly what they typed in. So you can say, look, dude, you just typed in dishwasher repair, and I repair dishwashers. It's perfect. Come come hire me. Uh, that's why. Um, that's why. It's because the keywords go with the ads in the ad group. You, you can use dynamic keyword insertion to try and jimmy your way around this and that kind of stuff, but there's no, there's no extra fee for having extra ad groups. <laughs> and so rather than trying to figure out some way to hack uh, one ad group with lots of keywords in it to have lots of different ads in it for those keywords and oh by the way the uh, you'll 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 break down when you're trying to actually analyze the search term performance of the ads and a whole bunch of other stuff that I didn't talk about today but uh, but that's why that's why we do it now obviously there's not enough volume on that to make it worth managing by itself and you know sometimes people are going to combine stuff sometimes we combine stuff but we try to avoid combining them as much as we can because I'd rather pay the price of managing an extra ad group, which is basically usually just combining a bunch of data from multiple spreadsheets to look at stuff as a group, so that I can write an ad and know that this ad was tested against that exact search query, because I'm trying to optimize for that search result page. The way I look at this, and, um, and Leslie, I, I know you've, you've heard this story before, and Michelle probably has too, but we can't make them search, okay? The keywords are the keywords, right? People use these spy tools trying to find out what keywords their competitors might be having. 
go figure out what the keywords you want to be on, and don't worry about which competitors are where. You'll get once you're running the ads, you'll get better data about who's where from Auction Insights in AdWords than you will from SpyFu or any of these other yeah. fine pieces of tool. Um, because I left the S off of that last word. I, I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, but um, you can't make them search, right? Only a certain number of people are going to type that exact thing in, into a search engine every month. That's the limiting factor on how much money you can make. And so, what I try to manage to in the long run is what's the most profit that I can make per person typing dishwasher repair in my geographic area. Not uh, what's my cost per click or how many clicks can I buy. Or uh, I want to know. Ultimately, I want to optimize to what makes me the most money per search, and uh, of course, when I start to approach it that way, which is you know, I started to approach it that way like you know, 2003 or whatever, um, the first thing was you know exact match became the central part of, uh, of where we start. Even though we you know, we certainly want to build out from there and expand and get more volume, but uh, but I don't want to just well you know I was okay with exact match and I was I was okay with phrase match so I'll just combine them and just have a phrase match ad because it's the same thing no don't do it that way because at some point uh, actually adding bids to your phrase match starts to um, lose money right you're continuing to add profits but um, but actually you're you're losing profit every time you do it after a while and so you just have to separate the stuff out to manage it they're really different channels. Yeah. Neil says, uh, Roger, thank you. So, um, uh, Leslie, if you could pass it on to Roger. Yeah, you're right. Indeed. Says, so, so, Jan asked a question here that I know this was a little bit confusing. I kind of followed you, but um, it's about the. Okay, yeah. So, it's, yeah. so and, uh, you know, Leslie, I mean, you know, we've, we've had a couple of clients where we've had to explain this and talk them off a ledge because they don't understand why their high priority campaign isn't getting any, any clicks and all the sales are happening in the low priority campaign. What's going on here? Well, um, priority tells Google which campaign to look in first to try and put your ads onto a search query. And so um, if they can find ads to put onto the search query in the high priority campaign, then they'll never go look in the medium priority campaign or the lower priority campaign. Um, and so the reason why we bid higher is because we actually use negative keywords in the high priority campaign to exclude higher value keywords so that the, the high priority campaign can't show my most valuable keywords because I won't let it. Those keywords fall through to the medium priority campaign. Google sees that they can show my ads from there and oh look the bid is higher so my ad moves up the page and I win. So the way to think about it, conceptually, the way I think about it is, no. high priority for me is to make money spending the least amount of money, right? So actually, I think it's it's actually easier if if you instead of calling it it high priority, medium priority, and low priority, you call high priority low value, medium priority medium value, and low priority high value. Hmm. Okay. So in the high priority, you would always have. Black is white, night is day, and gray is still gray. Yeah, so high priority, you would only ever have the lower value ones where you're... You really want your high priority campaign to trigger when you don't have a search query that you already knew was going to make you money so that you could kick it up into up into your medium priority campaign. Yeah, yeah. so actually, it's, it's like levels of override. I mean, so yes. your, low, your low priority is the one that you know is going to work. And yes. then in your medium and your high, you're basically doing the overrides, which are going to adjust the bid, they're going to adjust the keyword set or something like that. Yes, and by the way, I mean, this is so confusing that um, the one time in the last couple of months when I did this by hand, I actually set the bids wrong um, the first time I did it. And then I, I, like 10 minutes later, I was like, wait, did I set the Put, is that so upside went, down? Went back and I'd raised the bid on the low value keywords and lowered the bid on the high value keywords. And Oops. Yeah. Well, it's you know, I mean, it's you know, ten minutes uh, yeah. later before I actually hit save, but still. Just, yeah. So Dale said, are the done for you services limited to one domain? Well, no, I mean, obviously you can have us work no, on domains, but no, we really don't care. Mm -hmm. uh, but a shopping campaign um, is uh, well, it's it's. Challenging to work through with one domain. Yeah, a little uh, multiple. Well, yeah, it's it's you end up having problems with the feed um, and uh, <clears throat> fighting with, with Google on Merchant Center. But no, you don't need to have one particular domain. It's just um, you're going to well, be responsible for that feed if you want to have 400 domains in your, in your 
chopping feed. And by the way, every single one of those domains has to be verified in, in, in Webmaster Tools and, and prove that it's yours before you can show ads for it. So people ask us all the time, can I, you know, can I hire you to run shopping ads to Amazon? No. No. Unless, well. Unless you're Amazon. Unless Jeff Jeff wants to call me up and. Sure. Um, I'll put in. I'll I'll put in a word for you. Or you know, really anybody there with the with the authority at Amazon to let me run your shopping ads? That'd be fine. You should be running shopping ads, guys. Come on. Would you uh, Would you give them a discount down to nine percent? Oh, um, easily. Yeah, maybe eight point seven five. Point eight percent. There we go. Amazon. Yeah. See, um, I, although to be clear, I want to make sure that Jan understands that or Jan uh, Dale understands like. Um, you can't really take you know seven domains that are spending three hundred dollars a month and get out on a minimum. That doesn't really quite work. Well, if uh, for search ads, certainly I don't care how many domains there are. Um, but okay. for, for, fair for, enough. For, for shopping campaigns, they're really they're they're separate shopping campaigns. Yeah, and they're set up individual. Yeah, indeed. Okay, wow. Well, and Mitch says thank you, exclamation mark. Not a question, but thanks, Mitch. Yeah, we appreciate that too. Awesome. Well, well, we went like right at an hour. So way to go, Dan. You know, not too short, not too long. Mm -hmm. Just right. Just right. Did yeah. we answer the done for you question? Was I zone out there for a second? I don't know. Were you zoned out there for a second, or yes, did you I first answer the done for, for you question? I did. I might have. Yeah, you might be you're in your same network connection I'm in. But anyway, who knows? All right, great to hear. So again, well, anybody that's got questions about the services that we do, whether it's you know search ads, shopping yeah. ads, whatever, you know, email us. We are happy to to you know talk to you. Um, I'd rather get on the phone and talk to you and, and make sure you understand what we do and I understand what you're trying to do and that we can actually help each other um, rather than uh, than, uh, than get uh, you know down the road with something and realize it's not going to work because you actually only make 2% margin on your products. Right. Yeah, um, indeed. That, that not enough, sell. by the way, folks. Raise not enough in case. Yeah. Stuff for less. So. <laughs> yeah, with 2 that's, that. that's the amount of your credit card processing fee. You don't have a way to make a profit of that. <laughs> but that's a different kind of break even. That's a different kind of break even. With cash. Okay, great. Well, I don't think we have a. Rather than go through the dance about what we're going to do next week, let's take that subject offline. I have no idea what our you know. Uh, well, I'd, I'd love week. to do part two next week. Oh well, next <laughs> week I will do part two next week. Because that's a win. You know, at some point, I have to deliver all three or four of these, and I'd like to do that as soon as possible. Then let's do that. All right. So next week is the ad triangulation method part two. Um, so that's great. I, I guess for that, we'll that. dive deep into how to actually set up and do the keyword research and that kind of stuff for search ads. All right. Deep into keyword fun. research. All right. Keyword good research is fun. Uh, if you say so. Okay. Keyword well, research for fun and profits. We like profits. We do like Profits that. Profits are yeah. good. Yes, they are good. Um, all right, thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, appreciate it, and uh, for Dan and Michelle and myself, that's everybody. Um, thanks, y'all. Uh, we'll see you next thanks, week everybody. for AdWords Triangulation Part Two. Appreciate y'all tuning in.